But basically what I'm going to talk to you today is about, uh, this is one of two lectures. Do I have to, oh, sorry, I used to do both, sorry, excuse me. Uh, so start again. Can you hear me? Right, okay. So what, I, what I'm here to talk to you about uh, today and tomorrow, depending on air front strikes, uh, is uh, as follows. Uh, I'm going to try and bring you into the field of remote sensing of atmospheric constituents from space. Okay, and this is something that um, I've been uh, very involved in for the last uh, 25 years or so of my life, and um, a little bit longer actually, uh, but I actually started off as a spectroscopist and kineticist, uh, working in laboratory, um, laboratory uh, issues, actually starting as a chemical physicist or physical chemist. Uh, I trained studying in uh, the laboratory and at the time in the late in the 1970s there were an awful lot of reactions which were poorly understood and I think there are still quite a lot of reactions and quite a lot of processes which are understood poorly um, and not necessarily fit for purpose. But um, the challenge in atmospheric science became going into the atmosphere and either measuring in situ, uh, looking at processes, say understanding today how much uh, ozone is being made or how much aerosol is being made, and to test in, in real conditions uh, what, uh, what we're actually um, seeing or what we're experiencing, okay? And in this context, um, it was a small step to say actually we should do this from space and uh, some aspects of at the time you know disconcerned by the uh, authorities was that you know there are lots of clouds and you can't see into the troposphere very often and this kind of stuff well all this is of course true but that doesn't necessarily say you can't do it so particularly um, today I'm going to introduce you to sort of the history some of the background to um, how we actually do this uh, and some of the progress we've made, uh, also uh, some of the uh, lack of progress we've made in some senses, okay, because um, one of the backdrops to this talk is that the discovery of the ozone hole um, in the middle of the 1980s was an extreme shock for uh, everybody around uh, because it was, you know, one of the, it's become uh, you may or may not know this, but Joe Farman, who discovered it uh, after a long and very successful life, died actually a couple of uh, weeks ago, actually, uh, of a stroke. So he was in his 80s. But I think this should be, I would like to dedicate this talk, in a sense, to a celebration of his life. But he actually began remote sensing from the ground using a Dobson instrument, as we call it. I'll explain more about these things later. Um, in 1957 in the International Geophysical Year and then he together with John Schenkel and Brian Gardner at the British Antarctic Survey made this remarkable discovery. And this remarkable discovery meant that at least in Europe which in the post-war period had been uh, somewhat slow to get a space uh, things together compared to NASA. It was in austerity a bit like now. <laughs> Uh, and uh, there were lots of uh, you know, other demands on money, so the space things got going a bit later, although a lot of the space world had been actually uh, developed by Europeans, uh, either here or somewhere else. But, uh, uh, so this was an opportunity, this, this marvellous discovery of a very frightening thing, which is that the impact, it wasn't the first issue where the Antarctic had been a... Um, a source of pollution from the northern hemisphere because the bomb tests of the 19, uh, early 1960s are already shown and in fact a lot of um, using uh, nuclear science uh, and making very you know good measurements on aerosols we've been able to understand how when you set off in the northern hemisphere uh, a bomb you actually got down to the southern hemisphere these were surprising thing. So it wasn't the first time that the southern hemisphere and the furthest part away from where people live had been affected. 
but it was a very remarkable hole in the sky type of thing and there was a lot of hysteria but that momentum enabled European governments in particular Germany to say we should do something about this and uh, um, the program that I'm talking about came out of that as well as out of people like me saying you should do this but that doesn't actually help very much <laughs> you need people like Guy saying it <laughs> or even even more important people than Guy anyway uh, you need the scientists like Guy and myself sort of putting these ideas up but most of these ideas get knocked down but occasionally they hold in there and I think a theme of this talk is all of the things that we've been able to create in the last 25 years including the uh, global climate uh, atmosphere pollution uh, monitoring type system uh, and modeling system because measurement and modeling is coupled together as you'll see we're short of information we're often having to add information in remote sensing uh, to actually get a good uh, to get a good understanding so models measurements are coupled and we've not got a system yet which is fit for purpose okay so that's all like an introduction to the background to this work and then trying to bring you up to speed and I'll use I'm hoping to use if the internet's working uh, an, an NO2 e-learning module that we created uh, in uh, a project called Accent uh, a couple of years back now for the workshop this afternoon. I'll have to test that here that it's working but uh, I hope that we'll be able to do that to get some practical experience uh, and today we're going to go through uh, you know what we're the background to this kind of how we get these data okay and uh, the sky is the sort of limit uh, but one limitation is the number of systems and tomorrow we'll probably get into that and I'll also talk a bit about limb sensing tomorrow which is perhaps less uh, interesting for those of you primarily interested in air quality and the troposphere but many of us including Guy come from the top down rather than the bottom up okay we all started at the top and worked down that was because it was easier to measure and do things up there surprisingly than uh, uh, the other way around because of the complexity of the troposphere okay and uh, the short lifetime of species and things like that this has been like the holy grail for remote sensing is uh, doing the troposphere so that's all you know useful information for you and we'll now run into the slides okay so I'm going to primarily focus on you know Gome and Saimaki because those are the things that I know best uh, I may drift into some other stuff depending on time but certainly for getting down to the bottom um, using solar radiation which is what it's about but of course we have active remote sensing there's a bunch of other stuff but it's limited to what I can talk about but I'll focus first of all on on uh, these measurements of certain key constituents in the troposphere okay which is um, if you're coming into the field or just starting the field these are things that are useful to know about okay so um, just a bit about what my institute is. I'm also um, a fellow of NERC, which is an organization which many of the any British people here are associated with. Uh, but my home base is the University of Bremen and it's the Institute of Environmental Physics, which has a kind of enclosed within it an institute of remote sensing. And uh, we have different types of remote sensing going on and uh, physical oceanography measurements in the ocean. And we're trying to look at the Earth system using physical techniques okay that's the sort of background to us and this is where we sit uh, no mountains around here in northern germany uh, not too far from hamburg and this is our, our building and these are the type of uh, ships aircraft uh, ground-based measurements and uh, satellites that we use we have um, you know about 150 people in all together and we're tied in with the alfred wegener institute uh, this is actually in German, but we're looking at the climate system, so trying to get measurements and understand subsections of it. Uh, and that's where, of course, the, the nature, the global nature of um, the fact that we want to measure from space. We're interested not just in... I remember very well in the early days of GOM when um, we had the first maps of ozone, uh, you know, from the globe, and our retrieval was working quite well over Europe okay and not so well elsewhere and uh, the local funding agency in Germany I shall not say who said well uh, that's okay we don't really care about the rest <laughs> uh, but, 
but uh, you know, obviously that's not a satisfactory uh, situation uh, as a scientist. Okay, so uh, you know, what's wrong with that? So uh, why do we have to know about all this other place? So pollution nowadays is stemming from the local to the global scale and uh, as well as global models. Uh, we need global measurements to be able to understand things, okay? And we need to understand this system in all its complexity and actually to predict forward. I mean, as a scientist, we're primarily interested in scientific curiosity, uh, you know, which is not a kind of a, 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 a thing that you do in your spare time. This is a professional job, uh, trying to understand how the system uh, works, okay? So we're driven by trying to understand processes Okay, and what I want to know is um, where we're going in, the, you know, how this system works. Eventually, maybe in 100 years or so, the system is so well known that it's entirely the job of the engineers just to control it. Like, you know, when my heating goes wrong in the house, I don't phone up the local uh, university and ask for a helping hand. Uh, I just call up the local company who come out and sort out my uh, thermostat or tell me that I've left the windows open or something stupid uh, and, you know, these kind of things. So eventually, possibly the Earth, we will be just managing it, okay? One of the backgrounds to this is that we probably have to change our mentality with 7 billion people on the planet from being um, kind of hun hunter-gatherer uh, types, okay, who believe that the resources of the world are endless, okay, and we just got to go out there and get them. Uh, this is, of course, a very vital uh, way, and it's very refreshing part of the American philosophy in many senses. However, the boat is getting pretty full, okay, and lots of things are under threat like biodiversity, etc., and uh, you know, the question is, when we have one species dominating so much as ours, uh, is this sustainable? So I think we have to move from hunter-gatherer to, like, guardian of the planet mentality, okay? And, uh, you know, that may well be that we, it's like looking after the garden, you know, that you keep everything in good shape. Uh, and, of course, there's a big argument about what good shape is, but that's where we have to go to. And that's this system we need to understand, and that's why we need the measurements, that's why we need the models. That's why we need the predictive capability to try and avoid unforeseen hazards uh, short term, like we're seeing in Germany at the moment in the Elbe, uh, where there's a huge a thousand year flood after the hundred year flood in 2002. Uh, so uh, is that uh, just statistics or is it uh, a sign of change? Of course, we won't know until a lot later. But anyway, those are the sort of motivations, okay? And our research uh, is around that, and that's what I'm going to talk about in part today. Of course, we're interested in, very specifically in the ozone layer, we're also very interested in the ignorosphere, which is the mesosphere and above, which used to be where all the action was. And of course, the troposphere, and in particular, the relationship between the uh, soils, uh, or the surface, uh, ocean and land, soils, phytoplankton systems, biosphere in the ocean and land, we're very um, interested in, in understanding those things. Okay, those are our instruments. I'm going to come back to them. And, uh, you know, in general, why do we care <laughs> about our atmosphere and need uh, global observation of, atmos of atmospheric composition? Well, the composition, you know, 3.5 billion years ago, approximately, the uh, composition of the Earth's atmosphere was totally different. Okay, after the first atmosphere had been blown off and a few other things, we had uh, an inorganic atmosphere with primarily CO2. But the invention or production of life on Earth resulted in oxygen being generated and oxygen um, when photolyzed by shortwave solar radiation results in the production of ozone, which produces a biologically, um, um, a biologically protecting layer and also induces a stratosphere. Not all, not all planets have a stratosphere. Uh, the Earth is one of the few, okay? So, and a region of inverse temperature, which results in a tropopause, results in controlling weather, okay? So, um, you know, life, and the interaction between life and the atmosphere, a key issue. But it's also, of course, um, the protective layer of the ozone enabled us to come out of the, or our predecessors, uh, forefathers, to come out of the ocean 
and uh, live on land without having a large protective shield of our own, okay? I don't know, like turtles or something, you know? Uh, we don't have leathery skins which are extremely, uh, uh, extremely stable to radiation or whatever. We have, you know, DNA which at 290 nanometers will be uh, mutated, unfortunately creating cancer, uh, skin cancer. So, you know, this is, um, uh, this whole system has got lots of many non-linear feedbacks and one of the non-linear feedbacks is humanity. And humanity is, of course, uh, through dramatic changes of population and the emissions associated with anthropogenic activity are having a massive impact on uh, atmospheric chemistry. And the, thing, the good thing about the atmosphere is it's actually uh, an early warning signal. So, um, you know, these are the things, um, if we can get a hold on composition, we can hopefully uh, establish what's going on in the future with models, as discussed before. I think we've seen that before. We don't need that anymore. OK, and that just summarized these things. We've got 2 billion more people uh, since I proposed Saimaki. We've got 6 billion more since 1800. We're in unknown territory. And so it's difficult to look backwards. We can learn lessons from looking backwards uh, in ice cores, etc. But we need to actually uh, you know, understand the system, and it's impossible to manage what you can't measure, okay? So we need measurements, uh, and we need these global observations. Okay, now when I started in the stratosphere, which I'll talk about a bit more tomorrow, um, the explanation of ozone uh, was a little better than this, because this was the 1929 picture, the uh, proposal by um, Chapman, to explain ozone, but unfortunately, that O3 plus O reaction, as kinetics got going, was far too slow. So the fourth reaction, so you have the photolysis of oxygen, which I was talking about before, the production of ozone, and then photolysis of ozone, which does take place, and this O3 plus O reaction. Now, uh, in the normal atmosphere, um, already in the early 50s, we'd understood that the so-called HOX reactions are uh, taking out these things, okay, or, or beginning to work as a, as a catalytic reaction here. Um, okay, uh, this system generally works. This is called the odd oxygen, so it replaces the uh, reaction that Chapman proposed with uh, catalytic families of reactions. I think I'm moving out of the scene here. Do I just come back there? Uh, and then in the ninth, late 1960s, uh, Paul Crutzen, my former boss, and uh, uh, also Harold Johnson was very much involved in understanding that oxides of nitrogen were playing a role, okay, and controlling ozone. And then Maria Molina and Sherry Rowland uh, proposed that uh, chlorofluorocarbons would be the source of chlorine or an additional source of chlorine. There is a little bit of chlorine going up there. And so this was all heterogeneous chemistry, uh, and the Harvard group and others proposed bromines. This is all very nice. And this was then going to be a 6 to 7%, this is like 1980, 6 to 7% uh, reduction of ozone at middle latitudes, okay, with the amount we were using. And this was already the Vienna Convention was started, but the discovery of the ozone hole, and that's like under normal conditions, you had something like that at uh, upper stratosphere, but in the, uh, uh, in the uh, ozone hole, you had these new uh, or at least previously unforeseen uh, catalytic cycles which wipe out ozone in the low stratosphere creating this hole creating what I was talking about which is a huge effort now that was uh, stratospheric chemistry now in the troposphere shortly before I started research this was the situation globally we did know that ozone was being made in Los Angeles and elsewhere, but it was only in the 1970s that we started to get ozone events in Europe. I worked at, at the United Kingdom Atomic Energy Authority, and we used to have, you know, we were, we were amazed when we started to get 80, 90 ppb of ozone on sunny days in summer, okay? And that was all uh, sort of fairly new in those days. And so these processes producing ozone, which I'm sure Guy's talked about, uh, and or will be, uh, and, uh, uh, these produce, things producing aerosol are what's controlling, you know, ozone and aerosol are the sort of air quality issues in the troposphere. And of course, they interact with clouds. Uh, there's a whole host of issues uh, going on there, but uh, they're also being impacted by changing temperatures, okay? And uh, 
in the last 20 years, we've added all these extra reactions. OK, so it's getting more complicated and the demands on the computing to do that are right. So we've got halogens in the boundary layer. We've got uh, uh, the interaction between even, you know, the proposals that iodine makes aerosol particles, OK, uh, through its uh, hydroscopic uh, higher oxide. So there's a whole bunch of stuff going on there. And of course, the interaction uh, with sulfur coming out of the ocean. So we've got uh, an awful lot of issues on the aerosol, an awful lot of issues on the um, ozone side. And to cap it all, we've got this changing, you know, temperature, humidity uh, system, okay, which is being impacted by man's increasing use or release of uh, um, CO2 and methane primarily, but also. Uh, the chlorofluorocarbon carbons and other, and N2O in particular, that's a big issue. Anyway, so we need to know, we need to understand what's happening, what's going to happen as the Anthropocene, uh, which is this name that Paul Crutzen's given to the age that we're living in now. Uh, the Holocene has sort of come to an end. We're in the age determined by man's activity at the surface. And we're also seeing some massive things like these. Um, these are older pictures now, uh, just showing the early uh, uh, loss. But in fact, 2012 was another record year. This is then a, an indicator of a change. OK, and uh, these are the type of uh, things you can do. The surprising thing, perhaps, is in the Southern Ocean that we're not seeing that. Uh, but this is more complicated because where there's no ozone hole, we're getting cooling as well as heating. So there's some complexities about what's going on in the Southern Hemisphere. So some bits of the Antarctic are shrinking and some are are not, but so that's for the experts. OK, but in general, what we're sort of looking at in this system is um, coupled natural and uh, uh, human activity, OK? The uh, fluorocarbons were a unique case where we added something that wasn't in the atmosphere beforehand or in the world uh, and uh, saw the results of it. But in the rest of the case, like CO2 or methane or also SO2, we're just changing around uh, what's there anyway. Now, in the case of SO2, you can see it in China now, uh, but in Europe, we used to have, uh, in the 1970s, the acidification of the lakes in Norway as a result of the release from um, Great Britain, uh, Germany, East Germany, and Poland, and France, and the, the low countries, the, uh, the release of SO2. Okay, um, France doesn't have much SO2 because it uses nuclear. There are other issues associated with that. Uh, but basically, those whole issues. So we, what, we're, what I'm trying to point out is here, we're mod modifying. And then it's much harder to separate what's a natural change from what's a, in the case of the lakes acidifying, it was fairly clear. But uh, in many other cases, it's not. So we've got this coupling, and we need to know uh, what the impact is in the troposphere on oxidizing capacity and the radiation balance. Okay. Now, ideally, we'd like to measure all these things everywhere. What this graph shows is uh, the typical sort of uh, uh, the time scale axis, OK, and the, uh, uh, the, the, the spatial scale. So what, what this says is that rea radicals uh, which have a, a, you know, are made and react very quickly, like OH or something, HO2, one of my favorites, um, these things are made so just in the local air mass. Other things are transported around the place, like CO, for example. And uh, some things like CO2 have extremely long lifetimes. And then on the right-hand side, we've got some uh, mixing scales, OK? Interhemispheric, um, intrahemispheric, uh, and the boundary layer mixing times, OK? So, these are, so mixing is a big issue for modeling convection. I don't think we're doing a great job on at all. I think uh, I'm sure the model modelists, as you French people say, will come back to this. And uh, but what can we do from space? Okay, so I'm finally getting there. What we can do from space is easily we can go to what's called low Earth orbit, uh, which is either sun synchronous, uh, which is then a polar orbit, which uh, means that we fly, actually the orbit stays the same and the Earth turns below it, okay? So that you have the same local time. So the satellites that I've been involved in, the early morning platform, as I call it, uh, which are the satellites are ERS-2, which is now being decommissioned and coming down, um, Envisat, which is now a sleeping beauty, the platform failed last year, 
and the METOP series from UMITSAT, uh, they are in uh, 9.30 to 10.30. So they come through and you can see them at night. At the same time, they also come by at night. Uh, because we're using solar radiation, we're only really working uh, during the daytime, but you can see them. And they're flying at about seven kilometers a second. So they take sh instantaneous pictures, okay? So that's the sun synchronous. Sun asynchronous is like the International Space Station. It uh, changes its uh, uh, crossing of the equator every day by a larger or little bit, depending exactly where it's flying. So by the, with the ISS, it's about an hour a day. So it slowly shifts its uh, crossing time. And then we can go to geostationary, where we look always, at the, as the Earth turns, we look at the same disk, okay? And that gives us uh, up to a quarter of the Earth. Um, we are going to get satellites which will be focusing on Europe for air quality in the... This is the, the, the realization of our geosphere concept. Um, that's coming about 2019. Okay, so uh, the idea is to have a constellation of these things actually at the end of the day where we have uh, very good coverage and very uh, good um, resolution. Because the issue is we'd really like to measure down to the sort of, you know, centimeter millimeter scale if we take the biological things we like to get to the leaf size okay and this is all actually feasible the only problem is money okay <laughs> which is uh, a sad story uh, and peanuts compared to what the oil industry uh, or what the energy industry is going through but nevertheless it is often a blocking and we have to be thankful for what we've got uh, for me the progress can't be fast enough uh, but uh, we have actually come quite a long way in the last uh, quarter century from almost no useful measurements to a system uh, which is potentially uh, going to be, at the end of the day, very good uh, for looking at all these things. But we're going to, you know, so the objective is actually to use these to look at these different chemical things. And obviously, numerical environmental, protect, uh, numerical environmental prediction or chemical weather. Uh, is a background to this, okay? Uh, and uh, actually, it's only, only in 2000, I remember being at a meeting with uh, Guy, where uh, the uh, first in the DLR, in, uh, it's only in 2000, where the late Tony Hollingsworth was also there. And we put forward these concepts because we're kind of scientists, you know, our creators of concepts and ideas, but we need also operational capability to realize these things and realize them in a sensible way. So, uh, you know, the reason why we're here today is based on those sorts of discussions between different groups of people saying what's really necessary and what we do. So the numerical prediction of, of environmental mental, uh, conditions is really important. And for that, you need also the inadequate measurement system. And I'm sure Guy's been talking about that. Now, what's the, this is the history. OK, so uh, we started off and we had an idea which is something like maps and got nowhere, as I said, then came the ozone hole, and then in 1989, bingo, we had a national satellite in Germany all on its own. We had a joint national thing called Atmos, uh, Globsat with France. Uh, unfortunately, they floundered, and what came through uh, were the uh, European uh, missions with uh, the small scale, uh, uh, which is originally proposed as Sky Mini, so Saimaki, or Skiamachi, as correctly pronounced, I think, uh, by the Greek name means chasing shad light and shadows, okay? And that's why uh, I gave it that name. Uh, and when, then we had a Skia Mini, and that became d -scope to become GOM. And we have a geo skier which is becoming d -scope to become uh, Sentinel-4, as we'll see in a bit. But uh, then there was a spin-off, or there is a spin-off called OMI, which is still working from the Dutch who worked with us. And we're going to have uh, Sentinel, f well, Sentinel-5 is then, we've gone operational because GOM-2 went onto the METOP platform, so that's an improved GOM. And we will be moving to Sentinel-5, which is much better. And there's a, a thing called Sentinel-5 Precursor, which is uh, a Dutch ESA uh, mission, um, UK actually involved as well. Uh, in the intermediate time. So it looks quite sort of good in, in many senses, but I'll come back to the point why we, we're, not, we're not moving fast enough in, the, um, in, the, in, the, in basically the production of uh, uh, high resolution data. And currently in Bremen, we've been pushing for the last uh, year or so 
uh, and hope to win through at the end of the day to use this, the ISS to do one kilometre measurements for all of these gases that we'll be hearing about. Now, the reason why resolution is such an issue is in the stratosphere, the wind systems are fairly fast, so measuring perhaps once or twice a day is sufficient, okay, to get maybe like, maybe, you know, two, three points, be a bit better, but uh, you can basically constrain things because of the mixture of wind and radiation, you can, can uh, constrain uh, the processes pretty well with a couple of measurements a day. In the troposphere, we have large variations, okay, and spatially and horizontally. And we knew that at the time, but we can't necessarily uh, always uh, get what we want, so we have to take compromises. So initially, the spatial resolutions of things like GOM are, are rubbish, actually, in, in real terms. But the point is we were demonstrating capability with, with those things. Now we're slowly moving up to, so Sentinel-5 will be, in 2020, something like 7 kilometer resolution daily, okay? Um, but actually, I think in order to get emissions and to be able to separate even things like roads and whatnot, we need to get to, uh, you know, one kilometre or better on the gas side and on the biological side, as I said, leaf uh, size. And actually, these things are, are all, I say, all entirely feasible. Uh, you need a good IT system behind it, but thankfully Moore's Law has been working all the time, so, uh, you know, get much better at handling large data sets. And I think that's a challenge for your generation of scientists is uh, rapidly dealing with large data sets. So you really need to be good on that side of things technically, okay, as well as computing. Uh, but the issue is then to pull out, out of these billions or mega billions of data points, to separate natural from anthropogenic and to be able to understand where we are missing processes in the description of our physics of the atmosphere. And this will now, this physics will now include chemistry and biology. Okay, good. Okay, this was our, uh, um, at the end of phase A, uh, basically an attempt by the agency to reduce us, saying that they thought we were too ambitious. I don't think we were ambitious enough uh, because you get a kind of generation pop at this. Now, originally we had two instruments, and these instruments uh, were supposed to make limb or nadir measurements alternatively. And at a budget cut at some point, we reduced to one instrument, so we have to do alternate limb and nadir in Siamaki and GOM uh, as such uh, only look in nadir. Now this is a problem when you have a gas like ozone where the bulk of it is in the stratosphere and you have to try and pull out the tropospheric component. Uh, so you know that's why we want uh, very good measurements of things in the upper atmosphere uh, to be able to pull out the things in the uh, underneath it. Okay, So-called residual technique as we'll see later. Um, right uh, the geostationary, we got the idea uh, whilst talking with colleagues in America in the mid-1990s and then proposed in 1998. This was greeted with, oh, this is a really good idea, but we don't want to do it now. And the end result is, after all this and lots of ups and downs, is that we will have the so-called, it was GMES, but it's now called Copernicus Sentinel-4 instrument on Meteosat third generation. And that's coming like 2019, 2020. But it's only, it's restricted to Europe and North Africa, which is dumb because we want Africa, you know, as well. We can look down to Africa, but it's the idea to keep these things small. They could put another one up there, but they're not planning to at the moment. Okay, and then the next opportunity uh, to make it better is 2035. So this is why I'm saying we need things like ISS to be able to test and go for, for new things. Okay, we're, we're actually running into a problem that the operational... Um, world has now got its plan in order and I'll tell you a joke which is uh, about the European Space Agency so they have uh, engineers who have to go to Dornier as was in Friedrichshafen in um, which is on Lake Constance uh, and uh, they travel from uh, uh, their home which is in Estec to Schiphol and they get on a plane they go to Stuttgart and uh, they get off at Stuttgart and they get the train to Ulm to begin with, and at Ulm they realise there are two Friedrichshavens in Baden-Württemberg, okay? And the question is, for the space engineer, which do you go to? Do you keep on the schedule, stick to budget and go to the wrong place, or do you change and go to the right place? And the answer is you stick on the schedule and go to the wrong place. 
Okay, and this is a problem with sort of operational systems. Unlike university professors, they can't change their tune very quickly, or even don't want to. So we are, we are a problem. Um, so that's an issue uh, for this sort of thing. So uh, we are getting there, and uh, as seen here, uh, these things are now coming up. So we will actually have this MTG system, uh, and uh, this will be a challenge for your generation of science to use and exploit to the maximum. Uh, it's got a lot of more good things on, uh, and I'll maybe come back to that later on. But okay, uh, if I now come back to my main theme, and I'm going to go to half past because I've been asked to stop then, uh, and uh, I'll be moving tomorrow into the second half of this and trying to add in uh, uh, a load more. But I've given you now some of the historical background to where we are. Uh, Sayamaki, uh, as I say, oops, uh, I don't know what's going on here. Um, this is, actually at the time, this is the world's largest sort of uh, civil satellite. Uh, so now it's sort of, I say, hanging in limbo in its orbit for another 100 years. But this is actually MBSAT in build, and actually our instruments on the outside here. It's in a clean room, and it's 10 tons. It cost everybody in Europe who paid for it uh, a cup of coffee. OK, about two euro. Depends how expensive you like your coffee. But um, I think that's actually really good value for money. And we should have 10 of them, OK? 20 euro would still be OK, from my point of view. But anyway, uh, that's what it cost. It's the size of a double-decker bus and was a huge thing to get into orbit. Now, what is actually what we're trying to do in this remote sensing business? So now comes to some more of the, the nitty-gritty physics. And uh, for those of you who are not molecular spectroscopists, molecules in the gas phase rotate, they vibrate, and they also undertake electronic uh, absorption. And when absorbed in two excited states, they Im emit. Now, we're going to use all of these different uh, abilities of molecules, plus we're going to use scattering theory to try and understand uh, from if we take solar light, we measure it above the atmosphere, we measure it coming back from the atmosphere, and then uh, we look at the differences, and those differences are attributable to uh, molecules absorbing rotationally, vibrationally, and electronically, uh, the surface absorbing uh, essentially electronically, uh, ocean as well, uh, and multiple scattering or scattering effects. We have Rayleigh scattering, we have Raman. And we have uh, multiple scattering variants on those things, OK? So these are the physics of radio transfer that we have to understand. Many things are wavelength dependent. And particles are different. So me scatter have different scattering characteristics to uh, small molecules. And basically, if we have all this right in our so-called radiative transfer equation, then we just inverse it, OK? <laughs> Simple. Well, for that, I have lots of clever people who do that kind of stuff. I now only do the talks. <laughs> and uh, in this context, uh, um, we do. But the point, is, the point I'm making is to be able to pull out all the information and understand where it's coming from, we physicists, at least, do not believe in black boxes. So I recommend you, at this stage in your career, to go back into the Hertzberg books of this life and check out that you actually understand about uh, the quantum mechanics sufficiently okay, of absorption. And scattering theory is then Chandrasekha, I recommend on those things, uh, as in the atmosphere. Okay? And then, I have six minutes left, Claire, if you're giving me that. Okay. Um, the, um, the, 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 the fact is, or a little bit longer, slightly longer, but the, the, the fact is we need all this now. If we've understood it, we will immediately then know that in the, in the short wave infrared, which is essentially about 1.3 to about 2.3 oh, microns, we're talking about um, vibrations of molecules with a rather energetic so-called force constant, OK? Uh, and uh, these molecules absorb vibrationally and rotationally because they rotate at the same time. So actually, there aren't too many that have their fundamental uh, absorption there. Okay? 
So what we're primarily looking at in, the vibra in these wavelengths are the uh, overtone spectra, okay? Not zero to one vibrational transitions, but um, at zero to two. For example, in the case of CO, fundamental band at 4.6 microns, first overtone at 2.3 microns. Um, very much like uh, in music, okay? So um, now water is, you know, one SOB uh, because it's got so many combinations, there's so much of it, it's got so many combination and uh, other band possibilities that water is sort of basically everywhere and uh, that's very good when we want to measure it, but very annoying when we want to measure something else. So basically we need an extremely good understanding of the spectroscopy of water uh, throughout this spectral region and going into the infrared uh, proper, okay? But just looking at the solar range, which is what I'm looking at here, uh, on the right hand side we've got vibrational rotational spectra and we're using those in fact to measure CO2, to measure methane, to measure water, to measure CO, okay? in these wavelength regions. Now as we move up, we move to low-lying electronic transitions. For example, my favorite molecule HO2 is, um, has a low-lying electronic transition, okay, at about 1.3 microns. Unfortunately, that's far too weak for us to use to probe its atmospheric concentration. Or it's actually, well, it's, it's not very strong. It's an allowed transition, but it's not very strong, but it's the combination of small amounts of stuff being there. In fact, these overtone spectra are weak, but because there's so much CO2 in the atmosphere with an increasing tendency, it's relatively easy to measure, okay, in these wavelength range. But, um, you know, something else that's much weaker, or much more weaker in concentration, would not allow us to do it. So, in the first part of the, you know, continuing the theme here, we're moving from, um, from, vibrational rotational to electronic vibrational rotational spectra. And these take place, uh, the electronic, Arabs, you can have either continuum or banded spectra. And we're fortunate. So when we excite a molecule to uh, a um, upper state, the question is whether this upper state is bound. Okay, if it's not bound, uh, because of the uncertainty principle delta E, delta T, time and energy, okay, uh, when it just falls apart, okay, then the consequence for the spectra is that we have continuum spectra, so we can't see features. Okay, this is, for example, the case in, should we say, parts of the Hartley band in ozone. We see a continuum, or the Schumann-Runge continuum of oxygen. So initially we see some structure because we're exciting into a lower lying electronic level and we see, uh, we, we're able to see um, features and we have vibrations and possibly also vibration rotations, okay? Uh, however, we always get somewhere into a continuum which is like blob spectroscopy. So you, so you have to take it into account, but there's nothing sort of, we want to, the thing is we want to use these vibrational rotational or electronic vibrational rotational or electronic vibrational features to be able to identify uniquely the gases that we're interested in, okay? To separate those from scattering other broadband absorption or whatever. And this is what this differential optical absorption spectroscopy and related uh, techniques do, okay? So, um, at this point, um, I'm just going to go a little bit further, but the, the, the fact is we're moving. And these are also, if you're interested in the molecular spectroscopy, these are often delocalized chromophores. Okay, so if you take something like formaldehyde, it's the double bond in the, in the CO that's absorbing. Okay, that's where the chromophore is in the molecule. Or in DNA at 290, the same system. Okay. So there's a lot of information about what we're doing, which is just fundamentally interesting. But actually, remote sensors, at the end of the day, are pattern recognition people. So they don't really care what the physics of it is, annoyingly, from my point of view. But uh, in fact, if you know the physics of it, you know a bit more, because you then know they may be temperature sensitive or pressure dependent. So that gives you another bit more information that you can pull out. 
So, for example, in the microwave on rotations, we're able from the ground, one of my former bosses, sadly dead, was the man who proposed, first of all, using the microwave to determine vertical profiles by looking at the combined pressure uh, uh, shape, okay, which is made up of pressure broadened lines from different altitudes. And there you get about six kilometer resolution in the upper atmosphere doing that. Okay? So we're using the information that's there, also temperature dependencies okay, of, of spectra to, identi to be able to pull out information about where the stuff is in the atmosphere. So we're using everything that's available and also topographic features. When we're looking down, if we know that a mountain's there, we know we've got a bit less uh, atmosphere, this kind of stuff. So we're using all of the information we can, but starting with identifying the spectra of the gases and the scattering characteristics of the uh, non-scatterers. So that's what I wanted to do first of all, and uh, we're going to continue on this one in my next talk, okay? I think we're about coffee break time, is that right, Claire? Claire's gone out. Okay, uh, Kathy, are you, are you now taking over? Are that?